welcome to Elements of Ayurveda, Empowering Wisdom of Life. I'm your host, Colette, and in this podcast, I hope to empower you to take charge of your own health by sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. We will also discuss topics like health and wellness, nutrition, yoga, fitness, meditation, breath work, and much more, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to Mother Nature, and to each other. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe to the show, and the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend you listen to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. I've also set up a Facebook group for us to connect and to support each other. And I'd love for you to join me over at Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. And now here's the show. Hey there, it's Khaled and welcome to today's episode. So as the title suggests, it's all about questions and answers. Now, a few weeks ago over on our private group, the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group, I asked people what were some of their health concerns or frustrations, and that's exactly what I'm going to address today. The first one I'm going to address today comes from Aurora, and thank you so much. And you said that your health frustration was super painful periods. Now, even though we are led to believe that premenstrual symptoms are normal in the West, the Ayurvedic perspective is that when a woman is in balance, she should not experience any PMS or discomfort during her menstrual cycle. I have seen the really profound effect simple changes to diet and lifestyle can have on women suffering from painful periods. Women who have gone through my cleanses usually tell me that their period arrives post-cleanse without any of the usual symptoms of cramping or breast tenderness or mood swings. So now, as you know, in Ayurveda, there's no one size fits all. You've heard me say it over and over again, but it's really important for me to repeat this because I would really recommend a private consult uh, for Aurora here or anybody experiencing symptoms like this because we would chat about your specific life, your diet, your exercise, your daily routine and so on so that we could put together a strategy specifically for you. But I'm definitely going to give you some tips and guidelines today. So in general, here are some typical PMS symptoms for the different mind-body type. So for a person with a high vata constitution, or it could be a person with a vata imbalance, they may experience anxiety, feeling disconnected or spacey, a feeling of restlessness, nervousness, maybe mood swings. A person with a high vata constitution may experience spasms or moving pain. Constipation can often be a factor during the menstrual cycle. Feeling worry or disturbed sleep, really light sleep, maybe waking up between the hours of 2 and 6 a.m., that vata time of the morning. For a pitta, the BMS or the menstrual symptoms could show up as excess heat in the body, like really overheating during the pitta time of the night, and that would be from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sharp cramps, irritability anger, sharp pains throughout the body. This could be headaches or migraines. Also, there may be some skin irritations like an acne breakout. There could also be nausea or vomiting, loose stool or diarrhea or breast tenderness as well. And then for cough, a person with a high cough constitution or cough imbalance, it may show up as lethargy, feeling down, feeling depressed. You may want to just withdraw completely from social life emotional eating. There may be dull pains here, like dull cramps, a dull headache, heaviness in the head, just a heaviness in the emotions. There could be water retention and bloating and excessive sleep as well, really feeling just a heaviness physically and mentally. 
Now, unfortunately, the Western society doesn't recognize or respect this very special time in a woman's monthly cycle. However, I have to say, I think that's changing. But in an ideal world, society would see this time as a sacred time for women to connect not only to their own body, but also to Mother Nature for insights. And we will be supported during this time. Now, I highly recommend you check out the episode I did with Woman Stands Shining, Pat McCabe from the DNA Nation. If you haven't heard that episode, check it out. She goes into a lot of talk about the importance of connecting with our cycle. And she, she suggests some rituals there. So I highly recommend that. But uh, just because our society as a whole doesn't support the menstrual cycle, it doesn't mean that we have to plow through it or get on with it. So here are some great Ayurvedic tips to support you during this time. The most important one is rest. Now, rest is key during the menstrual cycle because at this time, Vata, the energy that governs all movement in the body, is responsible for the downward movement of the menstrual blood. So we need to make sure Vata's in balance to ensure a smooth flow. Vata is balanced by routine, routine in sleeping, in eating, and waking hours. Avoiding overstimulation of the senses is also really important at this time. So taking time to yourself, taking quiet time. Now, while it may not be possible to stay home from work, you could ease off your workouts or your social get-togethers during this time. So thinking some calm, quiet environments. You know, if you think of a gym, which has got loud music and lots of banging weights and lots of noise and lots of people, that may not be the best environment for you while you're going through your cycle. And if you tend to get irritable, that will just cause more irritability. So during this time, spending more time at home or even going to a, a yoga studio, which you like and doing some restorative or yin or slow, slow yoga practices, Cooking nurturing foods that are easy digestible and that are grounding with lots of root vegetables, things like soups and stews. Herbal teas can really be beneficial at this time. Things that aid with uh, calm and, and digestion, maybe like some fennel or some lavender or some chamomile in the evening would be lovely. Also calming essential oils can really help, either diffusing them or putting them on a cotton ball in your pillowcase um, and having them throughout your home. Thing, oils like clary sage, lavender, rose, ger geranium, all these are really good for painful periods and, and discomfort during the menstrual cycle. So basically what you're doing here is you're making a little cocoon for yourself. You're making a really nice environment that's warm and inviting and comforting for yourself as you go through this time. So we have to respect the fact that our body is going through a lot at this time of the month. And so treating it well with nurturing Abhyanga oil massage, nurturing food, meditation, pranayama, journaling, restorative yoga, giving yourself some time to reflect will ensure an easeful, smooth flow. Now, for painful cramps, you could also try a castor oil or coconut oil pack. A coconut oil will be good for pitta constitution. Castor oil will be good for uh, kapha and for vata. And I will actually put those instructions in a download. So you can download them on my website. You just go to elementshealingandwellbeing.com forward slash freebies, or just go to the link in the show notes here. But essentially what you're doing is you're putting oil on a washcloth and then putting it on that area of the body that's sore. They're really amazing for health and helpful for any cramps. So life moves in cycles and this monthly cycle is a wonderful reminder for women to take time to rest and rejuvenate. Now, I did also see a post recently on Instagram, which was talking about a period revolution. And it described this as uh, women rising up to reclaim periods and hormones as normal and healthy and not something to be shut down with hormonal birth control. And I would add to that, not to be shut down by plowing through life. So I think it's important for us all to respect the menstrual cycle, to get in tune with our menstrual cycle. And it's definitely not something we should dread or we should 
like I said, try plow through life and just get on with it and ignore it. It's a very t a great time for us to reflect, to rejuvenate and take some time out for ourselves and um, respect our bodies because if we're ignoring it, it's going to try to get our attention in some way, whether that's through painful cramps or, you know, the body's always going to let you know when it's not happy. So thank you again, Aurora, for that question. Really great. And I hoped those tips helped you. So the next frustration was from Emma. She said, my overactive brain, it has its positives, but it's exhausting. So Emma, here comes the wonderful Vata energy again, creating lots of movement in the mind. And as you can imagine, our society of multitasking and mobile devices where we're on all the time doesn't help this problem. People with a high Vata constitution tend to be very creative and have lots of ideas buzzing around all the time, which is why a person with a high Vata constitution creates amazing art and music and poetry and writing and cooking and gardening. They're so creative and they're great in jobs that require lots of energy and excitement and change, something like sales and marketing. However, we need to manage that Vata energy so that it doesn't go out of balance and get aggravated and cause mind spinning and overanalyzing and insomnia and indecisiveness and decision paralysis. So here are some tips to help not just those of you with a high Vata constitution or Vata imbalance, but most of us living in this modern world with a busy multitasking life. Routine is key. Routine in sleeping, waking hours, and routine in your meals. That's key and really key for Vata and keeping Vata in balance. Mindfulness practices, meditation daily, at least five minutes. You can, you can find five minutes to meditate. Set your alarm clock five minutes early, get up, do it first thing, and that will really start your day really grounded. Breathe. Throughout your day, take a moment and just breathe and be present in your day. And especially when your mind is overactive and you're just feeling overwhelmed, which is what I hear from a lot of people. It's like, okay, you cannot make a decision when you're feeling overwhelmed. When you're unsure, just take time out, take time away, go into nature and breathe. Let your, you know, your phone at home, just disconnect. Also, some great things to really calm the vata, nervous system, and mind. Yoga, yin yoga, restorative yoga, slow flow yoga. Doing a yoga class, maybe after work, it's a really great time to just calm all that energy from the day. So if you're, you know, working in the city and even before you start your commute home, maybe you avoid the rush hour by just going to a yoga class. That would be a, a really great thing to do. And again, keeping that yoga class, so it's a chilled out class, definitely not power yoga, definitely not heated yoga. That's going to increase that vata even more. You want slow, relaxed, restorative. Now, as well for the mind, you want to make sure that you're writing things down. So I highly recommend that if you have these things going around and around in your mind, that you make lists, to-do lists, and journaling as well. So the, when you take it out of the mind and onto paper, it just releases the mind from having to keep that rotation and reminding yourself all the time. So write it down. That can be really soothing as well. And of course, you've heard me talk about before, a nighttime routine, really key for winding down that vata at the end of the day, setting yourself up for a nice restful night. Because a lot of times when there's an overactive mind, it can be hard to shut it down when you're trying to go to sleep. So this requires at least an hour prep before you get into bed, shut down all devices, unplug, set you know your room up. I talked about this in our recent uh, free sleep challenge, make your room a sleep haven, dim the lighting, have some nice essential oils, relaxing essential oils, diffusing in there, um, and make sure there's no technology in the bedroom, do maybe an Abiengo oil massage, have a bath or a shower, or maybe do some stretches, perhaps some journaling if you didn't get time to do it during the day. Just uh, see that evening routine as a wind down. Just really bringing calming things down, 
making sure that you're slowly preparing your body and your mind for rest. So Emma, thanks for that. I hope it helps. And uh, it's really important to calm that mind by calming Vata and calming the nervous system. And that will really help keep your creative ideas, but at the same time, keep that mind spinning and restlessness in the mind at bay. So our next question or our next comment was from Renee and Renee said being a high vata imbalance, which is pushing on other doshas, winter equals hot flashes and rashes because of my dry condition. But I'm so frustrated because I feel I have to ride it out till spring as I work to nourish myself properly. Each symptom makes me feel more depleted. Thanks, Renee, for sharing this. And I'm sorry you're feeling this way. And I'm definitely going to help you with some advice today. The first thing I want people to understand is what Renee means by pushing the other doshas. So the first thing we need to understand here, uh, I want to explain for people, is when Renee says that Vata is pushing on the other doshas. All the functions of the body are governed by the three doshas of vata, pitta, and kapha. However, vata is like the body's conductor, and it's vital. Without the moving energy of vata, the other doshas cannot function. Vata moves pitta and kapha around the body so that they can carry out their functions. When vata is in balance, it manages the normal functions of the body and mind. However, when Vata is out of balance or aggravated through lifestyle or diet or stress. It can push the other doshas out of balance also and push them around the body. Now, again, I know I sound like a broken record here, but it's so important to understand that everybody is unique. Each person has a different mind-body type and will have different signs of imbalance and will require different food, lifestyle, mindfulness techniques, etc. to bring their body and mind back into balance. In this case, Renee, you would benefit from focusing on balancing vata, as I mentioned previously, with a stabilizing routine, grounding foods, grounding mindfulness practices, hydrating and lubricating the body with oils, massage and the right oils and and liquids for your vata pitta imbalance. So along with balancing vata, similar to what I answered in the previous question, the pitta imbalance of hot flashes and skin irritations will have to be managed also to ensure that you're cooling the pitta heat but without aggravating vata. Now, what's important to remember here is that vata has a cold quality and pitta is hot in nature. So this would require a tailored strategy of foods, herbs, spices, routines that will calm vata and cool pitta without aggravating vata further. So if Renee, for example, here took all the advice to cool pitta, what would happen is that she may also aggravate vata in that process because then Renee will be increasing the vata cool quality in the body. So here's an example. Normally, the tastes that will calm vata are sweet, sour, and salty. However, sour and salty will aggravate pitta. Therefore, this is where in a consult, I would go through a client's diet in detail and explain what they need to avoid or bring into their diet in order to get their body back in balance. And then we would also do the same with self-care practices, with exercise and lifestyle, along with looking at the emotions and stress. So again, thanks, Renee. And I hope this helps you to understand that you obviously need to balance vata and pitta and really keep in mind that it it needs to be tailored to you. So focusing on the vata, focusing on the grounding and the calming, and also bringing in some of the practices for calming and cooling pitta but again it's a it's a fine balance between cooling pitta and not aggravating vata so again i would highly recommend a private chat um that would be something that i think would be very beneficial for you because we definitely don't want you to have to ride it out till spring that's um a few weeks away but on 
the subject of spring, which this may very well help you, Renee, and others listening, I have the spring cleanse coming up. The group online spring cleanse is starting March 29th. This spring cleanse will help you to reset your digestion. And what we do is we naturally, with whole foods, will take out the toxins, the emotional and physical toxins out of the body. And by doing that, that will take care of all those imbalances we're talking about. Most of the imbalances in our body stem from the digestive system, which houses up to 80% of our immunity. So by just taking care of the digestion, it takes care of not only the rest of the body, but also your mind as well. So all these frustrations we're talking about could all be taken care of in this group cleanse. Now, the important thing here is that it's tailored to you. It's holistic and it's tailored to you. And we bring in mindfulness practices of meditation and yoga and breath work. And I tailor the food and the lifestyle and the self-care practices to you also. So check that out on my website. You can find the link here in the show notes also. Now I will only be available for two weeks uh, for the consultation. So I have a 90 minute consultation with each person and a private consult so I can tailor the cleanse to you. And then I give you access to my private cleanse page on my website where there's a webinar every week with lots of details of why we're doing it and why we're using these foods and so on and lots of other um, videos and tutorials and, and handouts, etc. So I'm going to be traveling a little bit, so I am only available for two weeks to do the consultations. So please, if you're interested, book soon to avoid disappointment and to make sure that you get on my calendar before we start the cleanse. Okay, so I hope you can join me. It's a really great thing to do at the end of winter when everything is a little bit stagnant in the body and we want to clear out all that stagnation so that it doesn't cause any spring sickness. I also have a competition running right now where you have the opportunity to win a free entry into this spring cleanse starting March 29th. This competition is running until March 12th, so check out the link in the show notes and you could be in with an opportunity to win a free entry into this cleanse. So check out the competition page on my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com forward slash competition, or just click on the link in the show notes here. Good luck. Okay, now let's get back to the show. So let's go now on to my next question. And this is from Meryl. Meryl says, almost daily, I have an upset stomach in the morning from the time I wake up until anywhere from 12 to 4 p.m. Aside from seeming not right, it is very inconvenient because I constantly worry that I'll need to find a bathroom. I'm a vata pitta constitution. I've tried to stay away from spicy foods, but this doesn't seem to help. Thank you, Meryl, for your question. And I would like to ask you more questions here. But from your your words here, I assume that you're having a pitta imbalance because you said that you're worry of needing to find a bathroom. So that's makes me assume that there's an urgency to go to the to the toilet during the day. And this is usually associated with pitta, which can cause loose bowel movements and diarrhea. Now, reducing spicy foods is just one way to bring pitta into balance, but we need to look at your life, your whole life, holistically. So taking out spicy foods may reduce pitta a little bit, but you may have some of the other aggravating factors in your life. So for the body, for example, if we're looking at it holistically, for the body, we need to look at food and drinks. You know, if it's your pitta that's out of balance, are you eating a lot of pungent, oily, fried foods, sour foods like vinegar, fermented foods, yogurts, salty processed foods or nightshades like tomatoes or eggplant or white potatoes? Are you having a lot of caffeine or alcohol? And just a reminder that these foods and drinks may aggravate pitta, and so you could and uh, you could uh, temporarily cut them out until you get pitta back into balance. But once pitta is in balance, you can enjoy these foods and tastes, but in moderation. 
Now then, you know, we could look at your exercise. Are you being intense or overly competitive in your exercise routine? That can aggravate your pitta. And that could cause this irritable bowel feeling. We need to also look at your environmental conditions. Is it hot where you live right now? Are you exercising or are you out and about in the heat of the day? Again, that will aggravate pitta. Looking at your relationships, is there intensity in your relationships or are they harmonious and sattvic? So we need to look at, you know, is there um, intensity in your work environment, in your personal environment, and see if that's causing some of that excess pitta. In the mind, are you stressed out due to an intense work environment or do you put a lot of pressure on yourself? Is that intensity causing excess pitta? Or are you holding on to a lot of anger or bitterness or resentment? Unresolved emotions can also cause excess pitta. And then we, of course, have to look at the soul. You know, are you at peace with yourself? Are you getting to express your true self? Are you happy in what you're doing in life? So this is the sort of things I look at in an in-depth consultation. We look at everything in your life because it's not saying that, oh, you know, I have... I have an urgency to go to the bathroom, so let me just cut out spicy food. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to look at everything. So as you can see, Meryl, saying that you stopped eating spicy food is just a tiny aspect of your health. And we need to look at the overall picture of your life and and assess what's the root of this imbalance. And this is what I would do in a in an in-depth consult. So I would encourage you to to, you know, book a consult if you wish, so I can ask you some further questions and can give you some specific tips and guidelines. But I'm like I said, I'm assuming that it's a hit imbalance. And so I would say to calm the pitta, taking out any pungent, oily foods, any nightshades, any salty processed foods, and bringing more moderation, more calm into your life, and um, and being less intense in your life. So I hope that helps, Meryl. So let's go on to the next question here, and it's from Jen. And Jen says, her frustration is emotionally feeling stuck, and what direction I should take Next, career-wise, physically, as a vata, my bones and joints feel extremely poppy lately, although I'm consuming bone broth like it's going out of style. I'm trying a more balanced vata diet this week, as well as collagen powder. Great. Thank you, Jen, for your message. And you say that you have a high vata constitution and it seems like you're showing signs of imbalance physically with popping or cracking joints um, and also mentally with feeling stuck. So when vata is imbalanced, it can lead to mind spinning and indecisiveness, which of course can have you feeling stuck. And when your mind is racing and there's mind spinning and indecisiveness, it can have you feeling like it's hard to even get any clarity to make a decision. So there's also, there's almost like a decision gridlock here. So we need to focus on settling your mind. The dry, cracking, stiff joints are also a sign of a vata imbalance. Now, in order to give you tailored advice, I'd need to look at exactly what's going on in your life. And of course, I would like to chat to you one-on-one. -on -one. However, I can certainly give you tips and guidelines today. The bone broth can be good for a vata imbalance as it's very grounding along with collagen boosting qualities for your joints. However, as I mentioned earlier, we have to look at the whole body and this is why Ayurveda takes a holistic approach. So things like grounding foods with good fats and lots of moisture to lubricate your body keeping well hydrated throughout the day, so sipping on hot water or ginger tea to aid digestion, having a good routine, I mentioned that earlier too, sleeping, waking, and eating times, eating in a quiet environment so you can really focus on your food, avoiding dry, cold foods and conditions such as air conditioning, fans, or any drafty conditions, Calming your mind with mindfulness te techniques like yoga, or breath work, or meditation. Uh, also, for a vata person, uh, being creative, 
can be very calming and meditative also. And living in tune with the circadian rhythms, which I talk about in podcast number eight, if you want more detail on that, that's really key. So as you can see, Jen, it's necessary to look at the complete picture of your life in order to see what's causing the vata imbalance and how to put self-care practices in place to support you. And balancing your vata so you can calm the nervous system and mind, allowing you to access the insights and intuition about your next career step. So I would recommend start by focusing on balancing your vata on your health and well-being first, and that the clarity will then come. Making decisions right now while you may have this vata mind spinning and restlessness is it's not a great place to make a decision from because there can be moments of panic or fear that will, may affect your decision. So right now I would say focus on your health and well-being, calm everything down, and then the clarity will come once the body and the nervous system is calm. So I hope that helps you, Jen. And the final question today is from Tansy. And Tansy said, my biggest challenge has been letting go of coffee, such a seemingly small thing. I gave up smoking at age 24, and I rarely drink much alcohol now. I have no problem usually with behaviors if I'm aware they don't serve me. But coffee I have used as a way to get through since I got my first job at 16 or 17 years old. Now I'm 43. I have a lot of pit in my constitution and seem to take on quite a lot in, in terms of commitments and workload in all parts of my life. Then I use coffee as a way to get through instead of listening to my body's call for rest, replenishment, satiation. And instead, my ego mind takes hold. This is a mental addiction, I feel an inability mentally to let go and tied in deeply with years of fear of failure or letting people down. So after this long post, I guess my question is around how the mind, specifically the ego mind, can induce a fear which disconnects me with my true needs and that my higher self is trying to communicate to me rather than about coffee itself. Thank you, Tansy, for this message. And it was really interesting how you started to write about coffee. And through writing this message, you concluded for yourself that your actual question is about the mind and in particular how the ego can induce fear. Now, before I start to answer your question, I want to acknowledge the power of writing here and in particular journaling your thoughts. This is why I recommend it so much to my clients, as oftentimes just by starting to write about your feelings or emotions, it can bring you on a journey to the true source of that issue at hand. So just a moment here to that to say that I highly recommend journaling. And, you know, we saw it here in Tansy's question that she talked herself right into where the actual issue was. So, Tansy, in talking about your question, now we're not discussing here whether coffee is good or bad. In fact, I would say that the coffee is not the problem at all. It's your identification, Tansy, with what the coffee provides you that's the issue here. So, we're talking about Tansy's awareness that she has a battle between her ego and her higher self. And yes, I agree with you, Tansy. I believe too that it's the ego that's holding onto this need for coffee. In your message, you write, I used coffee as a way to get through since you got your job, uh, first job at 16. I seem to take on quite a lot in terms of commitments and workloads in all parts of my life and use coffee as a way to get through instead of listening to my body's call for rest. So I see a couple of things going on here. First, your high pitta constitution pushing forward and spreading like pitta loves to do, spreading with intensity and taking on too much and maybe overworking. So if I were chatting with you, Tansy, I would be asking you a lot about this intensity, as you said, in terms of commitments and workload. And the second thing I see here is reviewing your language. You mentioned getting through 
spice and it sounds like there's a struggle and I would ask you more about that if we were chatting, but it does seem like you're using coffee as a support or maybe a crutch to help you get through as if coffee is giving you some extra strength or power to get through this, this struggle. Now, as Eckhart Tolle would say in his book, A New Earth, you're identifying with a coffee or need for coffee by drinking this coffee. I will have the energy or the mental strength to get through this job, this day, or whatever it is. Eckhart says that what you identify with is all to do with content, whereas the unconscious compulsion to identify is structural. It is one of the most basic ways in which the egoic mind operates. The question is, are you finding, Tansy, that your strength, your power, your endurance Are you finding that through the coffee? Now, Eckhart says that this is exactly what the ego does. Ego identification with things. The ego is a creating an attachment to things. So does a lack of coffee make you feel like you can't get through your day? So logically, you know, Tansy, that the coffee is not serving you. And in fact, you think it's inhibiting you from gaining access to your higher self. Now, the ego doesn't like change, so it will convince you that you need this coffee, and it may bring up thoughts like, you know, you can't survive the day without coffee, you always have coffee, that's what you do, you won't perform as well without coffee, you know, you've had coffee since you were 16, who are you without coffee, you're going to have an energy crash without it, you won't be able to get through your day, you're going to struggle, and so on. The ego will bring up all those fearful scenarios so that you will hold on to the comfort blanket or the crutch of coffee. So how do you stop identifying with this coffee? Well, again, I'm getting my inspiration from Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth here. Just by recognizing, and you've already done that, Tansy, just by recognizing your reliance on coffee, that you have that awareness around it, you're already starting to free yourself from the hold of coffee. The more awareness you have around the need for coffee, the energy of the ego hold on it diminishes. It will be good for you to remember, Tansy, here that the coffee is not causing the problem. It's your identification with the coffee that's causing your block to accessing your higher self. And so in the moment you feel the desire or the need for coffee, it's important to bring your awareness to that desire and be present with it. And be curious about the emotions and the story that your ego is feeding you about this need for coffee in that moment. And of course, for everybody else listening out there, this could be applied to anything, right? To food, if you're emotional eating, to alcohol, to stimulants, can be applied to any scenario. The more awareness you bring into the present moment, the more that ego identification with the coffee or whatever it is will dissipate. So by getting curious about the emotions that arise, the more it will reveal the belief systems your ego has set up about your need for coffee to get through the day. So Danzi, I hope this helps answer your question or gives you some insight at least. And, you know, the, like you said, the ego is feeding you or your fear of failure and letting people down. So I would also say that, you know, journaling about that and recognizing those fears in the moment that desire comes up. Um, we talked about journaling a lot. And I think that looking, getting curious about that fear of failure, where that belief system comes from and that fear of letting people down and and writing about that a lot more and the power of the, the word and getting it onto paper. I think that would be really useful too. So thanks again, Tansy, for your question. I think it was a really great one, and I think it will really help people. Now, as you can see, I was truly inspired by Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth. I'm reading it again, and his teachings in this book are amazing, and I highly recommend you guys checking it out if you were inspired by some of the stuff I used today. He's also, at the moment, uh, is doing a podcast with Oprah, called the new earth conversations it's on oprah's super soul podcast and for the first 10 weeks of 2019 they're doing these new earth conversations where they're going through the chapters each week in the book every monday so obviously those podcasts will be available 
you know, evergreen. So you can access them at any time. But I highly recommend that. So go to Oprah's Super Soul podcast and you'll find the New Earth conversations there. They're really insightful. And um, yeah, let me know what you think. We have that Facebook page where I'd love to hear from you. I would love to hear from those of you who submitted these questions today, how, if this advice helped, what your insights were, what the outcomes were. And for those of you who have questions or frustrations, feel free to share them over on the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group. It's a group where we support each other. And as you can see, when I'm doing these Q&A episodes, I often go over there and look at what people are frustrated about or what questions are being asked, and I'll answer them in the podcast. So please check that out and join us over there. Also, as we wrap it up here, um, just a reminder that if you want to download the castor or coconut oil pack, which is great for any cramping in the body, just click on the link in the show notes or go to my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com forward slash freebies. And if you want to join the spring cleanse, make sure you check it out on my website or you can click on the link here in the show notes starting March 29th. And of course, I have that competition running until March 12, where you can win a free entry into the Spring Digestive Reset Cleanse, so we can unpack all those physical and emotional toxins trapped in your fat cells and get you ready to enter spring feeling light, clear, and energetic. I also announced recently I have a Patreon page where you can support the podcast if you wish. And for that support, you can receive access to a monthly Q&A where we can connect, where I answer questions that you have about the podcast. I share any info that I didn't have time to put in podcast episodes. And I answer questions, general questions about health and well-being too. So that's a, a monthly Q&A where we can connect. And this is for those people who donate as a patron to the podcast. And I appreciate your support. Finally, the last thing I want to remind you of is my Riviera retreat right here on the French Riviera in the town I live in, Villefranche-sur-Mer, October 11th to 13th, 2019. I'm going to host an Ayurveda and yoga retreat. People are already booking. So if you're interested, I would love to have you here. I'd love to show you my village and we get to have lots of fun and education and good food. And uh, it would be great to have you here on the Côte d'Azur in October. So check out that link in the show notes too, or go to my website, Elements Healing and Wellbeing forward slash retreat. Thank you again to all of those who submitted their questions and frustrations. I appreciate you sharing. And again, if you want to or have a question, feel free to share it over on the podcast Facebook group. And thanks again, everybody, for listening. I appreciate your support. And I will connect with you soon. Take good care of yourself. Be well.